comes up It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing When the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name to Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship Your holy name Your rich and love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all of your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise on ending ten thousand years then forevermore bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his hope name to sing like never before oh my soul I worship your holy name I worship your holy name yes I worship your holy name Amen. Greet your neighbor in the name of the Lord this morning. As you make your way back to your seats. If you'll turn over on the back of your bulletin, we do have a few announcements to make this morning. First of all, just a reminder that this evening we're going to be having our uh, fifth annual uh, potluck dinner and prayer walk up at the school. Uh, the different churches in the community come together and offer a, a potluck dinner and then we open up the campus and let people go around and pray over the classrooms and for the teachers and for the students and administrators. That begins at 6 o'clock this evening at the, high, at the school cafeteria. Uh, our church this year is, in, in, is responsible for bringing side dishes. So bring your favorite side dish, come up and enjoy a great meal uh, with us and uh, then go around and pray over the school as they'll be getting started tomorrow morning. And I, I know the kids are just pumped up and excited about going back to school tomorrow. Um, that'll be one of the joys that we lift up, I'm sure, this morning. But uh, it's time, that's time of year again. So please come and join us uh, for that. Also, 
I uh, got this text from Rhonda Riley this morning just to announce that uh, they had to cancel the Meet the Greyhounds and everything because of the weather, and they've rescheduled some of these things, so I just wanted to make you aware of those changes. The Meet the Greyhounds pep rally uh, will be this coming Friday, uh, August the 26th, uh, at 3.05, 3.05 p.m., uh, the many cheerleaders will still perform. Luke Hale, hopefully, will still be here to speak. No? Do what? Nothing. Okay. And that's going to take place uh, this coming Friday at 3.05. And then the uh, Hounds play Jayton that evening at, at 8 o'clock. The meal that they always do with Meet the Greyhounds, they're going to do that next Sunday right after church. Next Sunday, right after church, uh, from 11.30 to 1 o'clock at the cafeteria. They'll be serving burgers, fries, and homemade pies. They'll still have the silent auction, and uh, so you can come up there and eat or get some takeout and take it home. So the, the burger meal will be next Sunday after church for the Meet the Greyhounds. Also want to announce that if you have uh, kids or know of, of kids that are going to be junior high and senior high age, uh, we're going to be starting a Sunday school class for them next Sunday. Uh, Ryan and Caitlin Dorner are going to start that class. They're going to be meeting in the classroom right behind me here uh, next to the church office. And that's going to start at 10 o'clock next Sunday. So if you know junior high or high school students, please invite them or encourage them to come and be a part of this new Sunday school class uh, that we're starting. Uh, are there any other community-related announcements that we need to lift up this morning? Okay, still get some, uh, if you have addresses for Teresa for care packages, uh, college students and active military personnel, if you can get those addresses to her as soon as possible, uh, we can get those care packages on the way during the fall semester. What joys can we lift up this morning? Obviously, we're thankful for the abundant rain that we've received, and we give God the glory for that. Uh, but what else are we happy about today? Jackie starts nursing school. All right. Good luck, Jackie. That's wonderful. Proud of you. What else? Yes, Carla. I'm grateful that my daughter raised a very self-sufficient four-year-old. He started uh, kindergarten, well, preschool, actually. And all the kids were calling and crying, and he turned to his mother and said, it'll be okay, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, her daughter has a little four-year-old, and if y'all didn't hear that, started preschool, all the other kids are bawling and screaming for their mamas, and he's says to his mom, I'm going to be okay. And uh, out the door, out the door he went. Yes, ma'am. I had my son, who's four years old today. Um, I was blessed to be going to the birthday party. Well, great. That's a blessing. It's always a joy to go to those birthday parties, isn't it? Yeah, praise the Lord. What else? Well, I'm grateful that my daughter raised a very self-sufficient four-year-old. He started uh, kindergarten, well, preschool, actually. And all the kids were calling and turning to his mother and saying, it'll be okay, Mom. Well, I'm happy to lift up today. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a joy to have Daniel with us this morning. Uh, missed him this last year, but I hear he's going to be joining us and going back to school here again this year. So we're glad to have Daniel back with us. Raina. Oh, Raina got to go to the beach. Man, that is a fun time, isn't it? That's a joy. You bet. Lots of fun at the beach. Any other joys to lift up this morning? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're happy about that rain. Well, it's just a joy to see all of you this morning and to be in the house of the Lord. It's always good to do that. Um, if you'll take a moment and look at your list of prayer concerns, uh, we do have a few things to uh, put on the list this morning. Uh, most of you are aware that uh, Pinky Bothrop passed away uh, you know, Thursday night or early Friday morning. Uh, there's not going to be a funeral service. He did not want a funeral service. Uh, he wanted to be cremated and have his ashes scattered. I, Charlie told me where it was. I came Elm Creek or something like that's where he wanted his ashes scattered. And so that's what they're going to be doing to honor him. Uh, so there won't be a funeral service uh, for Pinky. Also, want to uh, it's a praise and a joy, but also just lift up Casey Mitchell uh, to you this morning. He was injured in the ranch roundup uh, rodeo. Uh, got a bronc riding accident, a severe concussion. Uh, but no broken bones other than, other than that uh, and was released from the hospital yesterday. Um, he's going to be sore for a while, but we're thankful that he's able to come home. And so we'll be praying for quick recovery for him. I also need to add uh, Georgia Keeter. 
uh, to our prayer list this morning. Uh, she was taken to United Regional uh, this weekend. Her, her blood pressure went up and her temperature went up and got short of breath. Uh, they've done a CAT scan on her and they have found a small, um, a small spot on one of her lungs. They're going to be doing some testing on that um, to see what they need to do uh, for that. So we just need to lift up the Keters uh, in your prayers as well. Uh, are there any other updates or additions to our prayer list this morning? Jody, I had somebody out at Elbert ask about Danny. How's Danny Bella doing? Okay. Okay. So he's doing well. All right. Very good. Any others this morning? Okay. So that's that's another step forward. That's wonderful. Thank you for that update. Anything else? All right, well, let's prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning just so grateful and thankful that we can come into your house and worship you this day, sing praises to you and hear your word. We pray, God, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive the word that you have for us today. May it be a word that would renew us, challenge us, teach us, and enable us to leave this place and be your disciples to the world around us. Lord, we thank you for the joys that have been lifted up this day. We thank you and praise you for the rain that you've sent uh, and just... Uh, Give you the praise and glory for all of these things that have been lifted up. Help us to never take the blessings that we have for granted, but to always give you thanks and praise for the good gifts that you give us in our lives. And Lord, we lift up these on our prayer list this morning. We, we pray for the Balthrop family as they mourn the loss of Pinky Balthrop. And just pray that your peace and assurance would be with them this day, uh, that he is with you this morning, and uh, so that they can move on and, and have that assurance in their lives. Lord, we pray for Casey. We pray that you would continue to bring healing into his life. We thank you, Lord, that he was not injured any worse than he was and that you would just speed the healing process uh, in his body so that he can continue to do what you've called him to do. And Lord, we lift up Georgia to you this morning. Uh, in the uncertainty of things, Lord, we just pray that your assurance and peace would be with them as well, that you're going to be there with them through this time, uh, that you would give wisdom and knowledge to the doctors supernaturally, Lord, so that they can diagnose what's going on with her and, and give her the treatment that she needs so that she can come back home. And God, we lift up these on our prayer list that, that we haven't named specifically this morning. You know why they're on our list, and we just ask that you would be with them in the way that they need you the most right now. And, and help us, God, if we see names on this list that we recognize that we would in some way reach out to them with your love this week in some way. God, we pray for this community. We pray for those this morning who are waking up not really knowing what it means to know you as their Lord and Savior. And we pray that by our example in our lives that we would be a light in the darkness for them. Lord, we pray for this nation. We pray that you would raise up uh, godly men and women uh, to serve as leaders in our country. Men and women who would stand firm on the truth of your word, Lord. And that you would just bring revival to your church that you would help the church to come awake and, and be uh, what it needs to be in the communities that it's in and begin the process of revitalizing our nation through each and every church and community within this country. God, we pray for our world. God, we pray for those this morning who are, are fleeing war and terrorism, God. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are, can't worship in a place like this but have to worship in secret for fear that they might be killed simply because they believe in you. Lord, we pray for their deliverance. We pray for peace. And we, Lord, we pray that you would raise up 
an army of missionaries who can go into these places, these dangerous places, and spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who would call us enemies. For it is only by your grace and your power uh, that true peace can be found. And God, when we come to those times when we don't know what to say or even how to pray, just help us to remember we can always pray with confidence the prayer you taught your disciples when you prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nation. He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever Author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Take me as you find me all my fears and failures and feel my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in and now I surrender the Savior He can move the mountains my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So, send your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory. Of the risen King and Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Well, that was uh, in a different key there, but I committed to it, so I just had to stick with it. I appreciate y'all hanging there with me. Man, that was up there. Let's try that. Let's do one. Let's do that first verse again. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of nation. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. 
That's better. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, no. Lord, well, now we just ask that you... Oh, it's time for the children's message. Sorry. I'm, I got off there now. If you got him all twitter now. Yeah, now, now we're... Let the little children come and we'll have our children's message this morning. Go what? At least I go one day a week. One day a week, all right. She gets to learn a lot in one day a week. Boy, you're going to be four, four, six, four, fifth, 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 four, second, Trevor. Kindergarten. Kindergarten. All right. We have a lots of fun ages. Are you going to school this year? No. Okay, you got one more year. Lydia's got Grammy school. Lydia has Grammy school. She sure does. <laughs> lots of different things. Yeah. You're going, you're going to first grade. Have you ever said anything that you wish you hadn't said? Can you take it back? Can't take it back in. I know a lot of you all can see it, but we're going to do this anyway to show you the average. Okay. I know, I got this from Teresa. Okay, I'm going to get a toothpaste and I'm going to. These are my words. My words. There's some words. There's some bad words. There's some not very nice words from that little kid who came to school and doesn't have very nice clothes. And this is to that teacher I don't know. <laughs> and this is to the high <laughs> suck it back up, huh? You want to put it back in there? I haven't. How? How do you put it back in? I can't remember what it is. Sure, it's like, oh. Some food. Is that what you said? Alright. 
I'm in my house and I do it with the sugars. Okay? Alright. Let's hold hands and say a prayer. You say a prayer? As the children return to their seats or go to the nursery this morning, if I could have some ushers gather in the back, we'll take our morning offering. Let us pray. God, we come to you this morning and we ask that you would bless this offering as we give it. May we give with cheerful hearts. May these funds be multiplied and used for your glory here in Throckmorton and around the world. Amen. You may be seated. Well, over the last several weeks, uh, we've been talking about uh, spiritual warfare. And we've discussed uh, who our enemy is and how he came into being. And we've discussed uh, how he operates and how he attacks us, uh, how he attacks our thoughts, how he finds weaknesses in our lives and tries to exploit those and, and tempts us. Uh, to do things that we know we shouldn't do in order so that we could be uh, ineffective for the kingdom of God. We understand that as followers of Christ, he, you know, the devil can't have our souls. You know, he's lost that because our souls belong to Christ. But he still attacks us in an effort uh, to destroy our witness. To keep us from being effective members of the body of Christ and, and to keep us from helping God to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world around us. And uh, we have to uh, understand that this battle is going on on a constant basis. Now, we can't always blame the devil for everything. We can't always say, well, the devil made me do it. Uh, there's times when we make conscious choices of our own free will uh, to do things we shouldn't do. But that doesn't mean that Satan is, isn't actively trying to attack us as well. And I think sometimes we like to think that uh, we're, we're pretty tough, you know, that we're pretty strong uh, warriors uh, for, for God, you know. We kind of like to see ourselves maybe as a, as a Rambo, you know, with the bandana tied around your head and the bulging muscles and the big machine gun, you know, and you're doing battle for the Lord and you're just a pretty tough guy. But as human beings, do you remember how the Bible describes us? Do you remember how Jesus describes us? He says we are like what? Come on, somebody said it, I think. We're like what? We're like sheep. We're like sheep. We're like sheep without a shepherd. We're like sheep. And I'm sorry, sheep are just not 
altogether that tough. So we have to be brutally honest with ourselves and say that in our own strength, uh, we're like sheep. So just repeat after me. I am a sheep. And I have wool for armor. So we need God's armor. We need God's strength. We need God's might in order to fight this spiritual battle, to fight off the attacks of the enemy. And so today in this third uh, lesson in the series on spiritual warfare, we're going to be looking at the armor of God. Most of you have probably heard this passage of scripture before that talks about the armor of God, but we're going to take each piece and kind of break it down and, and discuss what it is uh, that we're putting on ourselves in order to be able to fight back against the enemy. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 10 through 18. And so if you have your Bibles with me, or if you want to follow along on the, on the screen, you can do so. Here are the words of Paul here as he's talking about, first of all, the battle that we're in, and then the armor of God that we're supposed to put on. So here are the word of the Lord this morning. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which, which you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now this morning we're going to look at those first three pieces of armor that Paul tells us we need to be wearing. So we're going to be looking in verses uh, 14 and 15 specifically this morning. So if you want to look at those verses, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I know some of you uh, do this. I mean, I'm, I'm known to do this, maybe write some notes in the margin or underline some things in the scripture. If you want to mark or circle or underline these words, uh, then that might be good for you to do. Uh, make sure that you mark the word truth in verse 14. Also the word righteousness in verse 14. And then the word peace in verse 15. These are the first three pieces of armor. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and the boots of peace. As so I help you remember, just think of the three B's. Belt, breastplate, and boots. The first one is the belt of truth. And uh, we have to understand that when Paul is describing this to, to his readers, he's having to give them a visual. He wants them to be able to see something in their minds uh, to, to make something spiritual make sense. And the only uh, thing that he could probably come up with that they would all understand is the armor that a Roman soldier of that time period would have been wearing. Because the Roman army basically ruled the whole entire uh, part of the world that Paul and, and Jesus and the apostles were preaching in. And so everyone knew what a Roman soldier looked like. And so the Roman soldier's belt was very important. Okay? Um, many of us would just wear a belt to keep our pants up. You know, and that's about the only function it has. I mean, I honestly, over, over the last year or two, you know, or a few years, um, my pants have shrunk to the point where I don't have to wear a belt to keep them up anymore. Uh, I just kind of wear it for looks. You know, so some of you are wearing a belt for looks and some of you are wearing it to keep your pants up. But uh, in, the, in the Roman soldier's world, the belt was a part of his armor. It was made out of mail or leather and it was wrapped around his waist and, and he kept his uh, cloak you know, they had a cloak that kind of flowed behind them. If they were in battle, they would tuck that cloak in their belt to keep it from flying around. 
And it also held, you know, all of his weapons. It kept his sword and any other weapons that he might have uh, close at hand so that he could pull those out at any moment in, in, in the battle. And so it was a, an integral piece of armor in his, um, in his armor. It tied everything together. And so in our spiritual battle gear, truth wraps itself around the believer. It is truth which ties together the believer's armor. And in our warfare against Satan and his demons, our enemy uses deception and deceit as one of their weapons. And it is our belt of truth that illuminates our way and enables us to be ready to fight. And I think if you were, if you look back over the time in, in, in our society, you would see how deception and dishonesty uh, have become more of the norm rather than the exception. I mean, some of you are old enough to remember, uh, maybe you heard stories of your father or grandfather when a handshake was all that was necessary to seal a deal. People were just honest. Uh, they strove to be people of integrity and honesty, and nowadays that just isn't the case. In order to close a deal, you're going to have to sign a million papers in front of a notary public and have a lawyer look over it and everything else just to make sure somebody's not trying to take advantage of you. Truth has become lost in a lot of our culture. And we have to be reminded that in this culture, the culture, and when I say culture, I'm talking about the culture that is outside of the church. I'm talking about the culture around us, uh, uh, the unbelievers in the world. Uh, Satan has been given permission by God to have a certain degree of power here in this culture for a time. Okay, for a time he has this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says that Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So out there in the unbelieving world, Satan uh, is blinding people to what truth really is. And I know I've discussed this with you before, but it bears repeating, especially in this culture that we live in today, truth can never be found within ourselves. You hear people talking about my truth. Okay, I heard that on television just the other day. This guy was talking about, well, when I discovered my truth, as if truth is just relative to the individual. In this culture, the culture the enemy is in control of, he wants you to believe this about truth. He wants you to believe that truth is just whatever you want it to be for you, as long as it's not hurting anyone else. And no one has the right to say that your truth or my truth is wrong in any way. My truth is just as valid as, as your truth, no matter how crazy it might be. Now the technical term for this is moral relativism. That all truth is relative and fluid and can change at any moment depending on how we feel or by what we experience. And I truly believe this is one of the enemy's most insidious attacks on the people of God. Is he's trying to convince you that truth is just whatever you want it to be. Paul warned Timothy about this kind of truth. Or about people who are seeking to define truth in this way. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 through 4, Paul says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead... To suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Friends, real truth is not dependent upon our emotions or on our experience. Real truth can only be found in something outside of ourselves in something that doesn't change as the culture changes and does not seek to be politically correct. Truth is found, the kind of truth that he's talking about here that we wrap around our waist, this kind of truth is found in the person of Jesus Christ and in his word, the Bible. And that's it for the Christian. 
And that's sometimes hard to swallow, but if you study the lives of Jesus and his disciples, hey, they were never politically correct. Jesus didn't mind stepping all over people's toes to tell the truth about God and about God's kingdom. And neither did his disciples when they started the early church. I mean, look at what happened to them. Because they weren't willing to be politically correct, they all ended up dying martyrs' deaths. You know, say, well, John didn't, but he kind of did. He was exiled off on an island somewhere and spent the last of his life out there on an island. They didn't water down the gospel. They didn't change it to fit the culture. And because they were not politically correct, it cost them their lives. You know, I like to think about it this way. You know, there's a reason why somebody came up with the phrase, the truth hurts. Because sometimes God's truth does step on our toes a little bit. But it keeps us on track. And it keeps us focused in the right direction if we will just follow it and not be swept away by what the culture says is truth. So right and wrong, truth, the kind of truth that we want to wrap around our waist is found in the life of Jesus Christ and in his word, the Bible. And that truth is essential if we're to have a chance in this battle. Now the second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate on a Roman soldier's uniform, it protected all of his, his vital organs of his torso, his heart, his lungs, his, his liver, his stomach, all of those vital organs that could so easily cause his death in a battle. This breastplate protected those. And righteousness is what protects us in those vital areas of our relationship with God so that the life of Christ within us is not harmed or removed. And we have to understand this righteousness comes from God. It's not something that we have inherently within us. This righteousness comes from God. You know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And it is through Christ that we are made righteous. Not guilty, but righteous. Innocent of our sins. That righteousness, which is through Christ, means that we are able to turn away from sin and experience fellowship with God. You know, in our tradition, we would describe that as, as, a, as a striving after holiness. That we are called to live a holy life. And by living a holy life, we are to become more and more like Christ. You were saved, you became a new creation. And now as that new creation, you begin to remove all of those things within yourself that are not of God. And you become a little more like Jesus each and every day. Romans 8.29 says, for, God, for those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed into the image of His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That's our goal. As followers of Christ in this world is to become like Jesus. To allow him to conform. To allow God to conform us into the image of his son. And sometimes that's not a pleasant experience being conformed. Okay, sometimes that can be kind of hard. It can be kind of tough to get rid of those things in our life that are not of God. But if we don't allow it to happen, uh, then we, we don't ever quite make it. You know, when we lived in Midland, we were doing some remodeling on our house and we decided to lay some hardwood flooring in our, in our house. You know, that kind, that, the tongue and groove stuff, you know, that fits together and you glue down on the slab? Well, it all looks so easy when you're in Lowe's or Home Depot and they're showing you how that goes together. Man, this is just so easy. But invariably, you're, you're rocking along and you're laying that floor and you get to the end of the room and there's that one little section of slab and that one little section of flooring you have left and they are not going to fit together. And it doesn't matter how you twist it, it doesn't matter how you push it and pound on it or anything else, it is not going to go in there. And so you take that little piece of flooring and you go out to your table saw. And you can form that little piece of wood to fit in that slot. And it's not easy sometimes. I had to do it several times. Cut a groove where there was no groove. Cut off this, you know, and, and, and it wasn't easy. Sometimes I had to go through two or three pieces of wood to make it happen. But you have to whittle it down. You have to make it work so that when it fits together, it looks nice. 
And it functions the way it's supposed to function. You know, our lives are like that sometimes. There's parts of our lives that if we're honest, you know, we're not living for God in that part of our life. It's just not, it's just not happening. And God wants to take that part out of our lives and sometimes he has to whittle and he has to chip and he has to saw and it hurts a little bit sometimes. But if we allow the process to happen, then we become more and more like Christ. And so we do that through the disciplines that we follow in order to become more like Christ. Bible study, prayer, devotion, service, coming to worship on Sunday morning, taking communion, fasting, tithing, and any other spiritual discipline that helps us become more and more like Christ. These things work in our hearts and through our souls and we begin over time to give up those things that are not of God and we become more and more righteous or holy. And the, and the more we do that, the stronger we become and the better able we are, are, we are to stand against the enemy. And finally this morning, the third piece of armor are, are the shoes or the boots of peace. Now it's been said that the Roman soldier's boot were the secret to the Roman conquest. The boot that a Roman soldier wore was an open-toed, spiked shoe which laced up past his ankles. It could, it could be compared to the shoes that a football player wear. It was like a cleat. All right? It enabled them to stand firm in battle and not be pushed back or to slide back. It enabled them to go over rough terrain or climb things a lot easily, easier because it had those cleats on it. And Paul describes that as the, as the boots of peace. That sounds kind of interesting. But when we battle against the attacks of Satan, we must have the gospel of peace to stand firm. Because there's three qualities of peace that we experience as Christians that help us when we're being attacked. That first quality is the peace that we have with God. As Christians, we understand that we're no longer fighting against God. We're not turning our will against His. Paul tells us in Romans 5, 1, that therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we understand as Christians that because of the good news in Jesus, we now experience peace and harmony with God. We no longer struggle against Him or, or His will for our lives. And that gives us strength to know that we have God on our side, that he is for us, that we are at peace with him. The second quality of peace is that we have, as Christians, we have the peace of God. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You guys have experienced this peace. When you're going through a really tough time, and you're going through a struggle, and you suddenly feel that overwhelming sense of peace and assurance that God is there with you, it gives you the strength to endure. It gives you the strength to keep going. It gives you the strength to take that next step, to keep fighting the battle because you know that He is with you, that He's walking with you, even though it may be dark all around. And even though it may seem hopeless, you know God is with you. You have the peace of God. And it gives you the strength to take that next step. And then the third quality of peace is, is the ability that it gives us as Christians to literally become peacemakers. We are not only to experience God's peace, but we are supposed to be actively working to promote God's peace. Matthew 5, 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of of God. Now what is a peacemaker? I think sometimes when we think of a peacemaker we think of some little, you know, person who hates conflict and doesn't want to have any kind of uh, issues with anybody and just wants everybody to get along and be happy and, and never, never takes a stand for anything. That's, that's not what this is talking about. You know, biblical peacemakers, okay, don't really worry about offending people. You know, a peacemaker is one who seeks peace by helping others find ways to get along even though they may not agree with each other. A peacemaker is someone who seeks to right injustice when they see it. 
They don't ignore the situation. They, don't, they do get involved. A peacemaker is one who looks out for the weak and the innocent in our society and seeks to help them know that they are loved by God. See, a peacemaker is the kind of person who's going to get involved in things like stopping modern-day slavery, human trafficking, child labor, elderly abuse in nursing homes, etc. You name it. They're out to right injustices. They're right to, to bring peace to the world. A peacemaker is often right in the middle of the mess that's going on. And they don't seem very peaceful, perhaps. But they're looking for ways to resolve things and restore things back to the way God intended for them to be. Now we have to remember that the enemy, they don't, he doesn't care about us. Satan could care less about your life. He could care less about your happiness or your joy. He simply wants to destroy you. And if he can destroy the weak and the innocent, the people with no voice, then he will do so. And so we need the peacemakers to stand in the gap and fight for them. Knowing Jesus gives us something to hold on to, to have something to grab when problems arise. So putting on the boots of peace enables us to stand firm. It gives us traction in our life. It's a way to plant our feet against Satan's attacks and climb and walk on uncertain ground. And when we wear the boots of peace, we can face any attack Satan may throw at us and be able to stand firm because we have the peace with God, we have the peace of God inside of us, and we know that we have the strength to withstand it. These are the first three pieces of the armor of God that we must put on. And if you think about these three pieces, it's kind of interesting. The first three he discussed, uh, a Roman soldier is always going to have those on. You know, they're always going to have their shoes on. They're always going to have their belt on. They're always going to have their breastplate on. They may not always have their sword out. They might not always have their shield up. They may not always even have their helmet on. But they're going to have these first three pieces of armor on at all times. We must wrap ourselves in the truth that is in Jesus Christ and his word. We must protect our heart with the righteousness of Christ by seeking to be like him, to seek to be holy. And we must put on the peace of God to stand firm in all of life's situations and to help to bring peace where there is none. And we know Satan's going to attack us. It's not a question. It's a guarantee. And we're nothing but defenseless sheep with wool for armor without God. And it is only by putting on God's armor that we can defend and defeat these attacks. Next week, we're going to be looking at the rest of our armor. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. And the secret weapon we have in fighting our battle against Satan. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning acknowledging that we are defenseless without you. By ourselves, in our own strength, we cannot stand against the attacks of the enemy. And so we pray, Lord, that you would give us the, the courage each and every day, each and every morning when we wake up, to put on the full armor of God so that we can go about doing the things you've called us to do so that we don't have to worry about the attacks of the enemy. Because the strength that you give us is stronger than anything he could ever throw at us. And so I pray this morning that each person here would understand that, that if any are struggling this morning, that they would begin the process of giving their lives back to you. If any this morning find themselves in a place where they know, they recognize there are areas of their life where they haven't committed to you, that they would do so this morning and give it to you, God. And then each and every day put on that armor so that they can stand firm and fight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As Brady comes to lead us in our final uh, song this morning, if, if, you, if you need prayer this morning, if there's something going on in your life and you, need to, you need, would like for me to pray with you this morning, the altar rail uh, is open. If you would like to commit your life to Christ for the very first time, maybe you, you've really never given your life to Christ, then the altar is open for you to do that as well. Um,
Or maybe you would like to join our church. If, you're, if you would like to come and officially join our church and become a member, then we'd love to receive you into membership this morning. And you can come down and meet with me uh, here at the altar this morning as we sing our closing song. These are the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord and these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sore, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes. Riding on a cloud, shining like a sun at the trumpet calls.